Ruby Frankie. We're going to get into it. Okay. So going into this segment about the passengers. So let's just jump in. Everyone grab your notebooks. Get ready. Because we're going to have to ask ourselves some tough questions today. So a couple of things I want to say is that going into this story, the world, the world, okay, has reacted very specifically already. I think it's pretty clear universally abuse of children is not okay. And we all agree on that front. And I am stoked to hear it from conservatives like Brett Cooper to leftists like H3H3. Like everybody has come together to say no abusing kids, which I think is a very beautiful thing to see. Now, the uniqueness in the Ru Ruby uh, Frankie story is that she is, it's Frankie, right? Not Frank, Frankie, Ruby Frankie, Ruby Frank, you be Frankie. The uniqueness about the situation of her kids and her YouTube channel called The Eight Passengers is like not not just the audience disagreed with her content, but YouTube itself did. YouTube is the one that deleted her channels because of the controversies and possible like child abuse around her case. Even though technically when YouTube deletes a channel, we don't always technically know, right? But it is one of those things where I think it's very, very interesting, very interesting that there were or could have been people who maybe didn't see this as abuse. And I want to talk about the nuance between those two realities, right? Uh, if you guys know, Ruby is a Mormon or has a Mormon background. And this is not speaking for all people who identify as Mormon. This is a very specific woman who's having a very specific relationship with that title, who lives in a very specific place in Utah, who raises her kids in a very specific way. This is like talking about a very specific person, right? <clears throat> and as I'm reading the story and I'm getting the details, it's clear to me that society might be moving in a more optimistic direction. So I want to be optimistic, but realistic. Like realistically, people don't change overnight, but optimistically, this I think is like kind of beautiful that everyone across aisles and in different bubbles is agreeing like, mal um, you know, malnutritioned kids, uh, duct tape around their hands and wrists, abuse and tormenting your children is not okay. And I know it's a very low bar. I see your comments. It's a very low bar. I know. But I am so grateful <laughs> for any form of humanity, any form of humanizing because it is very hard to even have people reach that low bar. And so like not to like toot my own neurodivergent sense of justice, but I felt pretty good in how people were angry at this woman. Now, look, this could all be not real. Maybe we're living in a reality where all of her kids conspired against her and came together with her relatives and her and, and everyone in her life and like, oh, they're all, you know, they're all evil and she's the innocent one. But we're going to refer to the news. We're going to refer to investigators. We're going to refer to the people who've done the work and the people who are actually, you know, prosecuting her for six counts of felony, child endangerment, torture. It was like a whole slew of things. I have the NBC article I'm going to reference. And then I have Philip DeFranco we're going to watch just so you can hear like a news source, both YouTube and regular, tell you the story. But we first have to agree that like the news is an okay source of information. It's not perfect. And people lie. But independent journal, like journals and news sources, they're all the same possibility of lying to you. Like, I don't really believe in independent news. I don't think it's a thing that exists. I think it's a thing we pretend exists because people who usually go into independent news have bias and that's why they start it. So regular news, it doesn't matter where you get your news. You're getting someone's bias. Everyone's biased. Every single person, all of you. So NBC says... Ruby formally charged with six counts of felony child abuse by Washington County attorney in Utah. Frankie, I think it's Frankie, goddamn, and her business partner, Jody Hillbrandt, 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 Hildebrandt, were arrested last week after law enforcement found Frank's 12-year-old son emaciated with open wounds and duct tape on his wrists and ankles. The boy, boy had climbed out of a window of Hil Hildebrandt's home, not Ruby's, though they share a home, so it's confusing. And ran to a neighbor's home for help, according to the probable cause affidavit acquired by NBC News. Frank's 10-year-old daughter was found in Hildebrand's home in a similar malnourished condition, according to the affidavit. Two kids. Okay, so there's six kids, and then there was two parents, and they had a YouTube channel with two channels. YouTube deleted both their channels, right? Very important. 
Frank rose to prominence in 2015 through the Eight Passengers YouTube channel, which featured her, her husband, Kevin, and their six children. The channel had a following of nearly 2.3 million subscribers before taking before being taken down. Two million. And I didn't even know who this was. <laughs> Now, of course, I'm, I don't follow family vloggers. I think the last time I was invested in a family vlog was when the Shaytards were famous. And like, does anyone even watch them anymore? Oh my gosh, what are they doing with their lives? I don't even know. But like, hello? Like this, two million subscribers. And I'm like, who? Remember this. Every time you think someone's famous, like Mr. Beast or PewDiePie, remember that it's, they're not. They're famous. They know superstars, but lots of people don't know who they are. So it kind of reassures me as a YouTuber that no matter how popular I'll get, which has always been a huge anxiety of mine, that you know what? I'll never be popular enough to actually have this anxiety. I'll never be like the president of the United States where everybody will know who I am, right? So this is crazy. I didn't know who they were. Two million subscribers. Um... So she frequently collaborated on parenting and relationship advices, uh, advice videos with Hildebrandt for Connet, con, no, how do they say this name? Connections? It's like connections, but with an X. Hildebrandt's life coaching service criticized for its extreme teachings, including rejecting children who do not abide by their beliefs. YouTube did confirm to NBC last week that it had terminated two of her channels, so both her channels. A couple of things I want you guys to keep in mind when we're covering this story, right? Hold on, this little hair is tickling my neck. Hello, ma'am. <laughs> oh my God. Um, okay, a few things. I don't know how you guys feel about family channels. I do have a hesitation around parents who share their children online. I'm not saying it's black and white, and I'm not saying I'm completely opposed to it. I think there have been so many cute instances where Philip DeFranco has showed his kids or Ethan has showed his kids. There have been so many instances where it's been really, really adorable. But I think there is something suspicious about a parent who wants to raise their kids to be really well-rounded adults who puts them in the limelight. Now, look. I'm as hesitant to believe the good intentions of a parent who puts their kid on YouTube as much as I'm hesitant to believe the good intentions of a parent who puts their kids in Hollywood. Okay, look, I'm a progressive, I'm pro-choice, your body, your choice, do what you want. But I do think it's sussy, given what we know about the corruption in these industries, that you would push this onto your children, that every crush they have will be on the internet. Every uh, every moment, like when they get their cycle for the first time is on the internet. Even Jazz Jennings, who I really, really like as a consciousness, I think it did her a disservice being on TV, being in the limelight, being this, you know, very first, very young trans kid that we saw as a representation of trans people, that's a big responsibility. And we've seen, I've done a video, My one of my best podcasts was the differences between joy and happiness. And Jazz Jennings is the feature of that. To give an example of why Jazz, even though she got her surgery and even though she's reaffirmed in her gender and even though all these things are happening, why she's still not happy with her existing. And it's because literally she hasn't had a chance to ask herself, like, what do I want? And when you're a child, whose parents are dependent on you making money to fund them, there is a lot of abuse, right? <clears throat> a lot of um, opportunities for abuse, right? We don't want to say there's automatically abuse, but there's opportunities for it. So I want to go ahead and I want to also have Philip DeFranco cover the story for you guys in case, because I heard many of you or I saw many of you in the comments say you don't know anything about the story. Let's watch his segment for those of you who don't know about the story so we can go ahead and um, have that conversation. Okay. Does this look good? Can you see me? I'm trying new things. Yes. Okay. Can you tell me if his video is going to play? Because this is my first time doing this tech. Thank you. God bless. Or on today's brand. Okay, let's turn it up because he's low. Brand new Philip DeFranco show you daily dive into the news. So just make How's sure that? you're subscribed Good. and let's jump into Subscribe it. Starting with, this may be the biggest YouTube scandal to date. Ruby Frankie has been arrested for child abuse, which if you don't know her, she's known for being a part of a very big family channel called Eight Passengers, which chronicled her life with her husband, Kevin Frankie, and their six children. But according to records from the Washington County Sheriff's Office in Utah, Ruby was arrested yesterday under suspicion of two counts of intentional aggravated child abuse. And actually her business partner, Jody Hildebrandt, was also arrested for the same reason. And as far as what led to this arrest, you had Fox 13 in Salt Lake City saying that a child had climbed out of a window at Jody's home and went to a neighbor's home for help. With a child asking for food and water, the neighbor noticing the child 
child had duct tape on their wrists and ankles and was emaciated, malnourished, had open wounds. And then after they were taken to a hospital, a second malnourished child was found in the home and later treated. So just absolutely horrifying news, but notably, to many who had been following Ruby and eight passengers, they weren't surprised. Right? She had faced tons of criticism for abusive parenting in the past. The eight passengers channel was even taken offline mm -hmm. earlier this year. With a lot of attention then turning to Ruby joining a new channel that was also controversial. Right? That was called Connections and Jody was the founder of it. And on its YouTube page, it described itself as a different modality of healing that psychotherapy cannot offer you. And claiming our training will help you transform your pain into joy. Choose the life you want to have. Exchange your confusion for clarity. Local news outlets also describing it as a parent counseling service. But also with that, you had insider reporting that many have accused Connections of being a cult. Some even pointing to Connections videos that show Ruby explaining kind of extreme parenting approaches. Things like in one video where she essentially says that children do not have a right to privacy. They're not concerned about privacy. That is the last thing they're concerned about. They're just trying to hold that word uh, over your head. They're trying to hold you hostage. In this home, you don't get personal space because this is my space because I'm the parent. And as my long space? as you're living in my home, it is my job. Okay, I just want to pause it right there really fast. I've heard this a lot growing up in a conservative home. There was this rule of like, this is my home. These are my rules. And I think that's a really important right that parents have. I think ultimately parents should be in charge of their children's well-being and parents should have the right over their children's agency. In a lot of ways, parents should be responsible enough to handle the responsibility of denying their children consent. Like, you can't hide drugs in my home. You've got Coke, you know, in the drawers. Like, you're 14. You can't do Coke. Sorry. You can do Coke later in your life. You can't do it now. I've heard these converse. I've had these conversations with my parents. My mother was infamous for going through our drawers. My mother was infamous for breaking my DVDs or taking things out of my drawers without listening. Like if I tried to sneak something in the house that like I had the L word ones from some friends. I had for getting Sarah Marshall. I had like all these things that I knew I wasn't supposed to have in the home and I would like hide them in my drawers. My mom would just find them and throw them away without telling me. And then I'd find out she threw them away and I'd confront her and it became a whole thing, which is a great way of – um of building a distrust in your kids. There's like this TikTok where it's like my parents taught me to be an amazing liar. And I think that's true. I think when you have really strong boundaries with your kids, no, strong rules with your kids that are about your narrative and your narrative alone and you're not willing to hear your kids out, I do think it sets them up for being really good liars. Uh, I was taught very young how to lie because my parents taught me very early on that I was safer if I lied, right? Now, to be fair, the world is sort of safer if you lie to it sometimes, depending on what relationship you're having with the world, at what point you're interacting with the world, right? So I will say there's something to that. But in general, I do think it's better to have open communication with your kids rather than have this strict rule of like my home and then balance that out with the reality that these parents worked hard for their homes. You know how I always say, guys, like my parents rebelled against their parents, right? Okay, my parents were the rebels in their family, rebelled against their parents so they could have 10 kids and have a love marriage and have beautiful children together. And then their kids ended up rebelling against them. And they're like, what did we do to deserve this rebellion? And I'm like, what are you talking about? You taught me how to be a rebel. And at the same time, like my parents were their parents to me, right? Like the strictness of their parents, the thing that they ran away from, but even though they have like a good relationship later in their life with their parents, like the thing they ran away from initially <clears throat> is the same thing like I'm moving away from in my life, right? My parents go, I wish you would be Catholic. This would be so great, Betsy, if you would be Catholic, right? And then their parents were like, hey, you should like, you know, to my mom, stay in your first arranged marriage and like don't get a divorce. And my mom was like, no, I'm going to get a divorce. I'm the first woman in the history of this family to do it. And I'm going to do it because I'm not going to stand for the abuse I feel like I'm ha like enduring in this relationship. And she divorced this man and she married my dad and it was like a love marriage. And then his parents were mad because like, oh, my gosh, you can't marry this girl. She's been like divorced. And it's like Bleh. so they here they are, these rebels. But then they raise me in like one of the strictest homes I've ever been raised in, bro. So strict that like their kids have problems. Like we all have problems. Like my parents' kids came out great in so many ways. We have problems. I would even say, and this is where I need you guys to have a very open mind. Very open mind. On a spectrum, I do think my siblings and I endured abuse. And I think these kids are enduring abuse. And I think much like many 
people out there, depending on who you are, there's always going to be trauma in life because life is traumatic, suffering in life. It's just, it's a lot. I do think it's on a spectrum though. So what we need to do in this episode is have a really open mind to what spectrum of abuse is everyone experiencing, right? So I would say it was better that I stayed in my family's home than CPS came and got us because the abuse didn't warrant getting taken away, but it could have warranted at one point, and my mom and I often talk about this, if there had been somebody in my life, like my godmother, God rest her soul, who died when I was quite young, if she was alive, maybe I would have gone and lived with her. I think she would have been able to give me a much better teenage life than my parents could handle because I was a queer kid who was having a really hard time being gay in a conservative home. I think my godmother maybe would have been able to handle that better, but I'm not sure because she died of cancer. I'm not, I don't know, but I was raised with her for a very long time, right? She was very important to our family. And so maybe that would have been better, but I don't know. Now, CPS, the government, these things have problems. Children, the amount of times they get abused physically, spiritually, sexually in these um, government entities is astounding. So we're not saying it's much better. The good thing about this particular case with eight passengers is that the kids are being taken by family. So that's what I'm mostly excited about because even the oldest sister who got out on her own has been trying to get CPS, trying to get the government to pay attention to the abuse that her siblings are enduring at the hands of the mother. She's been trying to get people to listen, family, friends, they've all been trying to get, but when they were first investigated a few years back, they didn't find anything. And that's the problem is like government agencies aren't perfect. They often don't find anything. And then literally... Kids will die the week after, two weeks later, because they looked at the wrong section or didn't look properly. So in this case, thank God nobody died, but there's obviously abuse happening. And obviously in my upbringing, abuse occurred. Now, the intentionality of the parents is really, really important because abuse could mean like intentional or it could even happen because, again, if you're pretty gay and you're growing up in a religious home where the religious people are just like, oh, la, 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 gays are going to hell, la, 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 gays are going to, to them, they're just saying something that's like a fact in their brain, but to the gay kid internalizing that information, they might end up having abandonment issues, they might end up having a desire to unalive themselves, they might start questioning whether or not they're valid as a person. So again, one of the things I need people to understand When we talk about nuance, we're talking about the nuance of you can have abuse happen to you. And if you had to choose one abusive situation over another, you might choose the one you're already in versus finding a new one, which is why a lot of domestic violence situations, women and men stay in those relationships even though they're being abused. It's not good. It's not healthy. In a perfect world, we would all avoid abuse. But not everybody is in a privileged position to get out of their like their abusive situation in the most like black and white way. So these kids reached out for help. Okay, so the older sibling wasn't being listened to. The uncles and aunts weren't being listened to until a 12 year old boy jumped out of a window and went to the neighbor's house. Did the cops finally have enough, let's say, evidence to actually consider this a case? Right. Okay, let's keep listening. Also resurfacing old eight passengers clips like one where Ruby said her six year old daughter forgot to bring a lunch to school, but she refused to drop one off for her. I know that her teacher is uncomfortable with her being hungry and not having a lunch and it would ease her discomfort if I came to the school with a lunch um, but I I responded and just said Eve is responsible for making her lunches in the morning and she actually told me she did pack a lunch so the natural outcome is she's just going to need to be hungry and hopefully Hopefully nobody gives her food and nobody steps in and gives her a lunch. You also have people pointing to one clip where she takes a- Hello? What are we even talking about? When we ask ourselves, like, is this abusive? What are we even talking about? When an adult woman denied her six-year-old food because the six-year-old was allegedly in charge of her own food. Like, what are we even talking about? So again- Okay, there's categories. So we have, let's say, my parents who raised me religious and raised me. They created this perfect bubble. It made them so happy. This is their joy. They raised their kids in this perfect place where they're like, yay, God and Jesus, and I love it. And then their kids come out gay, and then they're like, oh, my gosh, what do I do? And then they do the thing that they think is good, and they're like, 
gay people are going to hell. Don't be gay. And I'm like, gay people are going to hell? I'm nine years old. What does this mean? And then all of a sudden I start to form a personality disorder because of these well-intentioned parents that just wanted to save my soul. And now I get to pay thousands of dollars into therapy and spend my life like wanting to die. Okay. So this is like my parents intended goodness, but it caused like severe issues. And now the parts that I consider abusive are when I would tell them to stop and then they would just keep shoving Jesus down my throat. At that point, you know it's hurting your kids and you keep doing it thinking it will work. That's the abuse part, right? With her, same thing. Her child is being denied food at six years old. You know you're starving your kid. Abuse. Your kid has marks on their body that the government... I mean, deem torture, basically, torture tactics to your children. The neighbor saw and obviously grew concerned and called the cops on you. Physical wounds, right? That's abuse. You're like physically, even if your intention is good, too bad, right? Because at this point, your intention doesn't matter. You've physically harmed a child. You know what I'm saying? So now there has to be some question of you're either going to stop the behavior and realize like I am the lowest of low or you're going to defend yourself, double down. And in that case, you don't get your kids back, right? Maybe there's a rehabilitation process. Maybe there's some options. But again, what are we talking about when we ask ourselves, like, is this abusive? When this woman is saying she denied her child food. Can anybody explain that to me? For the people that are maybe defending this woman, though I've really seen nobody. If I'm being completely honest, I've basically seen nobody who knows the details of the story actually defend this woman. So I don't know who is defending this woman. Okay, they're not on my Twitter feed, but I want to know what people are talking about when they're saying like, is this abuse? She denied her six-year-old food. What are we talking about here, right? Like what, what are we saying? And you know what's so crazy is I'm sitting here, my progressive ass <laughs> telling myself like, I'm not going to have kids until I reach my standard of having children. And here's this woman who just like, I swear, people do not deserve children. And I'm not saying, I am not saying we should take away people's right to have babies, right? The government doesn't get to tell you what to do with your body, whether it's terminating a pregnancy or having a pregnancy. But I will say, I seriously am sitting here like, am I dumb? Should I just be having babies just so carelessly? Like, look at the world so carelessly having, like, carelessly having children. Just like, boop, 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 boop. No consideration for these children. I don't even know how... Or what is going on in their brains? Are they just lacking introspection? Which, fine. Are they mentally mentally ill? Fine. But it's just so absurd to me that this is, you know what I mean? And I get to share a planet with these beautiful, that's what I'm saying. I love being alive. I love being alive. I despise sharing a planet with people like this. Because I'm like, you make everyone's life harder. You literally make everyone's life harder. You had a babino, a child, a baby bean. And instead of loving and caring for that baby bean, you denied it food, took away their sense of agency and safety. You put fear in them. You made them friendless. This is what you've decided to do with your great, powerful mom status. And in the name of what? This coaching business they have, which is just like, what are we doing? What are we talking about here? You know what I mean? Like, what are we even talking about? Is it happy? Is it healthy? And is it kind? Well, not a lot of happiness going around, except for the mom's ego. Certainly isn't healthy. And it definitely isn't kind. It's so frustrating to watch. People have babies. Not want to spend time with them, right? From the parents who are like, oh, I have to babysit my kid. (laughs) Why did you have this child if spending time with your kids is like the worst thing ever? And you don't even do it that often, right? To the parent who isn't even home all the time. How is this like the worst part of your day? It's like, oh, I have to spend time with my kids. Why did you have them? To the mother who denies her children food. 
locked away her older son's bedroom as a punishment for pulling an elaborate prank on his younger brother. My bedroom was taken away for seven months and then you give it back like a couple weeks ago. I don't think our viewers know that. You've been sleeping on a beanbag. I've been sleeping on a beanbag since October. He was sleeping on the floor in the family room. And with all that, Insider even did a report back then in 2020 noting that these clips along with others prompted viewers to accuse them of child abuse and child and family services even showed up at their home. But that case was closed because reportedly the claims were unsupported. But now with Ruby being arrested, there have been very notable responses, including from the family's eldest daughter, who also apparently hasn't been in contact with the family for some time now because she wrote on her Instagram story last night. Finally, today has been a big day. Me and my family are so glad justice is being served. We've been trying to tell the police and CPS for years about this and so glad they finally decided to step up. Kids are safe, but there's a long road ahead. Please keep them in your prayers and also respect their privacy. And also asking that if anyone has links to any questionable or concerning content that's been posted in the past, specifically from Connections, to send it her way. Ruby's siblings also posting to Instagram to say that Ruby's and Jody's arrest needed to happen, also saying that the kids are currently safe. And so for now, we're gonna have to keep our eyes peeled for updates, right? People wondering with this situation, what's happening with the father, Kevin Frank. And actually with yeah. that, you had inside reporter Lindsay Dogston tweeting, Kevin Frankie is no longer an employee of BYU, a spokesperson told me. His employment ended there in spring, but it's unclear why. It's not yet known if he's also been arrested. But we'll be following the story here. And so when we know, you will know. And then y'all for- Okay, so, uh, wait, I saw a comment I wanted to read out loud. Where did it go? Oh, it's worse than that. They think they're more qualified to have children than everybody else. That is the irony is we'll have the same people who will deny rights to like, let's say queer couples or LGBT couples in general and be like, you can't raise kids. Like kids need to be in a two parent household. Kids need to be with their parents. Kids need to. And the same people right? Are these people, I swear they're always, it's always that way. Not literally always don't. Okay. Don't quote me on this. But when these bubbles cross, it's always amazing to me. It's like the same people that call trans people groomers. And then you find out like all of them have problems with like children, like abusing children. It is amazing to me how that happens. I'm just saying sometimes it's like a, sometimes it's a front. It's a front you know what I mean? To hide what you're doing. So you don't have to like face yourself and admit like, yeah, I do this to my children. I would love to see her just face herself. I want to see her face herself. Are, aren't they Mormon? Yeah, they're Mormon. Like they're Mormon and not all Mormons are like this, right? I ended up, you know, I lived in Arizona and I lived in a part of Arizona that had um like devout Mormons. They had like the hair and the clothes and everything. It was really interesting. They were nice to me, except one day I came in wearing a headscarf, so it looked like a hijab, and the woman wouldn't talk to me. Like she literally, I was like, hi, how are you? And maybe she didn't recognize me, but she was like, and I was like, I, can I get this please? And she was like, and she didn't talk to me. And I was like, what is going on? And I was like, it was so weird. But, you know, generally speaking, Mormons are fine. I've been to, like, Utah. I've been to, like, BYU. I've been there. People are nice. But, it, you know, uh, the Mormons operate very – we are each other – we have each other's back because we have each other's back. And there's good and bad when it comes to that, right? Like, good and bad when it comes to that. There's, like – Nice parts because the culture is going to support you. And if you lose a husband or get into divorce or something, you know, they'll support. They got you. And at the same time, there's something very like if you leave, then you might not get to interact with your family the same way or might not have the same friends. Look, the fear all of us have is that the communities we love and were raised with or the communities we've known or the communities that we've had relationships with might leave us or abandon us the moment we're different than their expectation. I think that's what's so hard about living in the world is that you have to find your bubble and you have to find where you're comfortable, where you're meant to be, right? You have to you have to figure out where where am I meant to be? Who am I meant to be with? Who are the people that I'm meant to do certain things with? And I think that we're all in search of that, especially with the loneliness you know, epidemic and everyone's so concerned about it, but nobody wants to ask themselves why they even want friends in the first place. It's like, why do you even want kids in the first place? If you're going to deny your children food, if you're going to deny your children access to friends, if you're going to deny your kids access to some, something normal, what are we talking about here? Now, look, my parents had kids 
and they love their kids. Like there's no doubt in my mind that my parents love us. I heard somebody or read somebody in the comments say that it's clear she just hates her kids. I don't know if it's clear that she just hates her kids. Like I'm not sure if that is what is happening, but I know for a fact that my parents do, do love us. I also know for a fact that my parents won't, just like a good Middle Eastern, <laughs> good Middle Eastern parent, they won't truly admit how they basically were the reason I am borderline. And it's really difficult, you know, again, when the internet tells you like, oh, you're borderline, so you're bad forever, don't listen to them. The same internet that says they care about people will ostracize people with borderline. Don't not even realizing like a lot of us get borderline as literal children. They have no idea how to suffer with and I get it, but it's really difficult. So major like amazing when people are able to go to therapy and go do DBT or CBT or anything that helps you. But there's something to be said about being raised in homes that have good intentions. They love you and you still end up with a freaking personality disorder. It's hard as parents to be like, I did everything I could and my kids still came out messed up. So I'm just going to ignore the fact that that happened. I'm going to pretend that didn't actually happen. And because I came out pretty okay, I mean, I do okay for myself, right? I found an amazing partner. I live in a great place. I have a good job. You could say like, ah, her childhood wasn't that big of a deal. And it wasn't compared to children who are being denied food. My parents never denied us food, right? So on a spectrum, of course, my childhood wasn't as bad as their childhood. I wasn't denied food. But that doesn't mean that it still wasn't very difficult. It doesn't mean, I mean, I have a borderline. Everybody focus. Your childhood can't be that great. Technically, if you come out with a personality disorder. Hello? If you come out with CPTSD from your childhood, yes, your parents weren't cutting off your limbs and maybe they weren't, you know, touching you inappropriately, um, but you still came out with some problems. So I think this narrative, you know what I mean, um, that like people are just good parents because they tried. Yeah, everyone's doing their best. Everyone is trying their hardest in the moment they're trying, but sometimes it's just not good enough. Oh, I said I get demonetized. Q2 says your borderline is your diagnosis. Your parents don't have to apologize. Um, I think you're wrong. I think you can think that, but my borderline was something that they, because of the environment they raised me in, basically created. I would not have had borderline if I wasn't raised by my parents. I wouldn't have had borderline if I wasn't gay. I wouldn't have had borderline if I wasn't raised religious. I wouldn't have borderline if a lot of things happened. But my parents, like many parents, had children because they made love and they did not account for the fact that they would have gay kids because they didn't think it was real. They didn't account that they would have kids that grew up in a home having to hear that gay people were going to go to hell or that gay people were evil or that gay people were, God forbid, like child predators. They didn't prepare. Like so many parents don't prepare. They have children because they're like, eh, I'm not going to be a bad parent. Did you think about your children coming out severely disabled? And every time I tell people, like, you should think about it, people are like, oh, but it's not going to happen to me. It's not going to happen to me. It happens to other people, but not me. My mom and dad had three queer children. Three. And they're like, no, 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 no. We don't have any queer children. That's crazy. That's crazy. And at the same time, like, they can't engage in the gayness without denying Christ. And these modern Christians, I love you so much. We're not here to play that game where you guys get to, like, modernize religion to, like, fit a narrative. I love that for you. But, like, traditional religions are traditional for a reason. Okay? And they're hard to deal with. Mormonism, Islam, Catholicism, Judaism. Those are some hardcore beliefs right there, buddy. Those are some serious believers, buddy. And they are raising children, maybe unknowingly, who are internally dying inside because they were born into a bubble that doesn't fit them and won't see them. <sighs> if 
There are studies showing certain degrees of trauma in childhood is actually beneficial for developing resilience and better outcomes. So here, again, better is subjective. Life itself is suffering. You don't have to be traumatized by your parents. Life itself is suffering. You're literally forced into existence and then you're born into a game you didn't sign up for. And then the bubble tells you how to win the game unless you don't want to win it that way. Then it ostracizes you. Then you have to figure out a new game to play. And then you have to feed yourself. Oh, and if you have medical bills, you have to go figure that out. Oh, and you have to figure out how to house yourself. Nowhere in history has life itself ever been easy. Life itself is suffering. Life is hard. You don't need the cherry on top of your parents abusing you. Yes, it builds resilience, but so does living your life. Living your life is an opportunity to build resilience. The world will give you tools. The universe will give you tools, okay? Justifying abuse by saying it makes you resilient, I think is the wrong way to think about it. Life itself is suffering. So these studies show that suffering builds resilience. But when people hear that, they're going to hear, oh, good, See, I wasn't that bad of a parent. Who cares if I hit you every night with a tent rod? Who cares if I denied you bathroom access after 10? Who cares if I did X, Y, and Z? You know what I mean? I think in an ideal world, we could talk through all of these scenarios and avoid all the abuse. I just think people aren't ready for that and they're not gonna do it in their own lives, right? They're gonna spin a narrative and tell themselves like, oh, this is... This is how it has to be. It has to be this way because they're weak-minded and that's the only way they understand life is how people tell them it is. Isn't that so funny that the same people who are, oh, this is just how it is, are the same people that are like, oh, I'm strong. And I'm like, um, you're weak if you don't adapt and change, in my opinion. But that's okay. Most people are weak. Most people want to think that it's just the way it is. And I think if you're interesting and nuanced, and a little imaginative, you can have a lot more out of life if you realize you can change the narrative. Sometimes it means not talking to your parents. Sometimes it means making a peace on an island far away from people. Um, Sometimes it means loving people from a distance. Sometimes it means changing your job, changing your gender. Sometimes it means doing a lot of things. But I believe in people's resilience. I believe in people's ability to truly change their lives with the right tools, with the right access, with the right brain, that you can have a better life than you have right now. But doing it out of bitterness, doing it out of, you know, negativity, I think is probably coming from a place of survival more than living. And again, we want to get to the point where we're living. Survival is so important. Like I said earlier, my parents really gave me the tools to be an amazing like survival. Like I survived so well because of my parents, but surviving also means lying and doing things that I'm not a big fan of in terms of my values because you're kind of like on a doggy doggy world. Like I get it. I do. I think the world isn't interested in your well-being. But the world is also, thank God, so selfishly self-focused, they also won't notice you. So that's the conundrum, is the benefit of the world being so self-absorbed is they probably won't notice you. If people were a little bit more self-absorbed, maybe they wouldn't notice you were trans either or gay or any of these things. But it's the moment they start to heal the world, it's the moment they try to help people that I'm like, no, 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 no focus on you, help you. They're like, I'm going to help you. I'm going to take you away from the homosexuality. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Please be more selfish. Please focus on you. And they're like, no, no, no. I have time. I'd love to help you. And I'm like, no, 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 no. (laughs) I don't want it. But you know, they don't believe you because they know better for you. Right? Is it resilience or being normalized to horrible things? Life is horrible. I don't know why we keep selling each other a message that it's not. Life itself is a conundrum of horror after horror. And yet, as an individual, separate from the horrors of the world, because humans are crazy, you can have a great life. Now, I believe in tiny contradictions. I know a lot of people hear me. So hear me, hear this. Life itself is beautiful. Come Stay with me here. If it was just you, if it was just a conglomerate of people that you got along with, what would be so bad about being alive? Nothing. I mean, it's hard. You have to like, find food and water and shelter and you actually have to do things. It's hard. But what is so bad about just being alive? 
Because the basic hardships, I think, are more than what we're prepared to handle. Just evolutionarily speaking, we are made to handle doing the basics, right? We're good at that. We've done it forever. That's how we got here. It's when you're dealing with people and you're dealing with different cultures and your different diff- different beliefs and different religions, things I think get in intensely stronger in terms of that need to be like, this is too much. With election season coming up and everyone's back into politics, I'm already seeing it. Where I even have to remind people like, hey, I am not okay with conservatives or Republicans. Like, of course, I'm okay with their humanity. Like, you're human. I value that. But I am not okay with your politics. And I think if you vote Republican, like, like we are not on the same page of what reality is, right? And I'm not saying if you vote Dem- Democrat, we're on the same page either. But I'm saying like specifically if you vote Republican, like specifically if you vote Trump, like specifically if you vote for those people, like we are not having the same relationship with existing or existence. It's fine if you do that. I'm not saying you're an evil person. I'm saying you're a person I wouldn't trust with my children. And I don't mean... I wouldn't let you babysit. I mean, I wouldn't trust you to like raise my kids in an environment that wouldn't put their mental health at risk because they might be gay and like they might be trans and they might have questions about things you don't want to answer because again, conservative and Republican traditionally also meant maybe religious, but usually means at least politically anti-LGBT. Like if the, and again, some people don't like this because they're like, no, no, Republicans and conservatives are this way. Your politicians are, your politicians are running on the basis, the top two contendants for president are, are usually associated with more conservative legislation, like legislation, like more conservative leaning. So again, okay, I'm not saying the humanity of an individual Republican isn't valued. It is valuable. I'm saying the politics that you guys are supporting is a direct threat to my existence and it makes my life harder, my existing. So I have to be very frank with you during this election season and be like, hey, just a reminder, you're basically voting against my civil rights. So like, don't do that. But also you're going to do that because you think it's probably better for the society. And that's why we have chaos, right? My parents would have loved if none of their kids were gay. That would have been great. If my kid, like my parents would have loved it if none of their kids were gay, but they got three of them. And maybe that was God's little gay blessing to them. You know what I mean? They allow that and indirectly support it. I think that's the problem is like, what are you supporting really? You know, wait, what, what, what about Republicans who vote Democrat? What are we even talking about? Who are they? What what is that group? What group is that? Death to family vloggers? No, no death to anybody. We don't want anyone to die. We just want people to have better options. I want everyone to have better options. Again, it's hard because, and here's where the nuance is coming in, right? When we experience things on a spectrum, it's hard to know, like, am I allowed to say that I was unhappy with some of the parts of my childhood? Because some people think I'm complaining and some people won't. And there's like this whole relationship with like what is abuse Yeah, I'm sick of reaching out for the truth And living life as a fool